Today, we're going to be looking at when Mendelian genetics doesn't exactly work out. It's something that we can call epistasis. And so, we're going to be looking at when the ratios don't exactly mimic the ratios that we're used to. So here's the deal. We're going to review the common Mendelian ratios just to keep ourselves familiar with them. And then we're going to look at epistatic relationships and see how those are going to affect the actual Mendelian ratios and why we don't always get the results we thought we would get. And then we're going to diagram epistatic ratios. Let's dive right in. First off, we have to understand what epistasis is. An epistasis is when the phenotypic expression at one locus, it depends on the genotype at a different locus. So what does that mean? Well, it actually just means that the way that one gene is going to be expressed depends on how another gene is going to be expressed. It's simple. Something on the lines of hair color isn't necessarily going to be expressed if I have an allele that's going to say I'm bald. Then you can't tell what hair color I have. I don't have a phenotype or of hair color and you wouldn't also know my hair genotype for texture because I'm bald. So if I don't have hair, then that means that the genotype of myself being bald would affect the phenotype for hair color or hair texture or different things of that nature. Next, some alleles are actually lethal alleles. In other words, they will cause a death of an organism. That death might not be immediate, it might not be extremely quickly, but the key is that they have an allele that will cause a disease which leads to death. And that is called a lethal allele. And they can have an impact upon our ratios as well because sometimes it means that the organism will not be able to be born and thus will end up changing our ratios. So if we were to look at something simple, we're going to look at dogs and we're going to just look at Labradors. You have the black lab, chocolate lab, and a yellow lab. Each of these is based upon their genotype. But as it works out, they don't have the straightforward ratios that we would anticipate if we were to actually look at you know, these three different phenotypes. Here's what I mean. The way it works out is they have these different options as their gametes. For Labradors, they only have two different genes for the colors of black, chocolate, or yellow and each of those genes has two alleles. If we were to take a gamete that is dominant for both genes and cross it with our four different options, as it turns out, you can see every one of the offspring is going to appear black. If we took a gamete that was dominant for the first gene but recessive for the second, as it works out, we end up with two black and two chocolate. If the offspring ends up homozygous recessive for the second gene, they end up being chocolate in color. If we take a recessive for the first gene and dominant for the second gene, we end up with two black and two yellows. Again, very similar to the previous cross, except in this case, if the individual, if the offspring is homozygous recessive for the first gene, they end up being yellow. If the gamete is recessive for both genes, we end up with this. 25% black, 25% chocolate, and 50% yellow. Again, if the offspring is homozygous recessive for the first gene, the offspring will appear yellow. If the offspring is homozygous recessive for the second gene, but dominant for the first gene, 
has at least one dominant allele for the first gene, then they will appear chocolate. And if they have a dominant allele in both genes, then they will appear black. And that leads us to this diagram, where we see that the different types of gene interactions that you can have of phenotypic ratios when you have epistatic relationships. In the first case, with no epistasis, you should remember two genes. We end up with the ratio, if we were to cross two heterozygous organisms, of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. 9 sixteenths of the organisms should appear dominant for both traits. 3 sixteenths of the individuals could appear dominant for the first trait and recessive for the second trait. 3 sixteenths of the individuals could appear dominant for the second trait and recessive for the first trait. And 1 sixteenth of the individuals we would anticipate would appear recessive for both traits. But with epistasis, that's not exactly what we see. We can see a 9 to 7 ratio, or a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio, which is actually what we see with the Labradors. You could also have a duplicate dominant, where you have a 15 to 1 ratio, or single dominant 12 to 3 to 1, or a dominant recessive, a 9 to 6 to 1. So we're going to look at how some of these different genes can actually interact with each other and cause some of these different ratios. To do that, we're going to look at mice. So in mice, you can have a mouse that has a coat that is controlled by many different gene pairs. For this, we're going to be looking at genes that control the coat color of a mouse. Typically, in simple form, we could just look at it in this dominant to recessive, where dominant would appear black and recessive would appear brown. That's the first gene. It either appears black or it appears brown. Now, we're going to add the second gene. The second gene is for something called a gooty, which is actually a yellow stripe in the fur. Now, in the agouti gene, which has that yellow striping, that is dominant, and non agouti that is recessive. It basically means that instead of the mouse looking black or brown, it will actually lighten the coat a little bit. So, now what we have is these two different genes working together to give the coat color. We now have black, brown, but we also have black agouti and brown agouti. The black agouti, that means it's dominant in both the black gene and the agouti gene. If it's black and not agouti, it must be homozygous recessive for the agouti gene. If it's brown, it means it's homozygous recessive for both. And if it's a brown agouti, that means that the first gene is homozygous recessive, but the second gene has a dominant agouti allele. So now, if we were to cross these two, you would see typical Mendelian ratios. Two heterozygous, where you're going to see, in this case, a black agouti crossed with another black agouti that are heterozygous for both traits. We are going to see the typical Mendelian ratio that is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. 9 sixteenths that would appear black agouti, 3 sixteenths that would appear black, 3 that will appear brown agouti, and only 1 sixteenth that would be plain brown. That does not show epistasis. Okay? We are looking at now two alleles, but they don't have an epistatic relationship with each other. For the epistatic relationship, we're going to add another gene, and that gene is for if the coat can have color at all. If they have a dominant allele, that means that the mouse would be able to produce a coat color. If they're homozygous recessive, they won't be able to have a coat color, and they will be albino. So, it doesn't matter what the first two genes are, if they can't produce color, then they can't be black, they can't be black agouti, they can't be brown, and they can't be brown agouti. 
If they can't produce color, they're just albino. So they need to have a dominant allele at the C gene for the A gene or the B gene to matter. If we were to cross two heterozygotes for coat color and for whether or not their coat can have color, and here's what happens. We end up with nine sixteenths that we would anticipate would appear black because they would have the dominant allele both in the B gene and in the C gene. So not only do they have the black allele, but they also have the allele that allows them to produce the black color. Next, we would anticipate that we would have three that would be brown. The three brown would be homozygous recessive in the B gene, but have at least one dominant allele in the C gene. And then we'd also have four that would appear white. Four sixteenths would probably appear white because they would only have the recessive allele in the C gene. And since they only have the recessive alleles in the C gene, they can't produce either black or brown color. So they would appear just albino. And so we would have a ratio of a nine to three to four ratio. So let's look at a little epistatic problem. I'll leave this up for a couple minutes and then we'll come in and solve it. All right, I know it's not been a couple minutes. If you're not done yet and you don't want to see the answer, you can just pause this video but we're gonna go in and look to see the way that we would actually solve this problem. Here's how it goes. First off, what you're looking at is, we had one parent that had a black agouti coat, the second parent had an albino coat. We were also told that the albino parent had the genotype, at least for the B gene as being homozygous recessive, and we already should know that because it's albino, it must be homozygous recessive for the C gene. We are also told that half the offspring were albino, a quarter were black agouti, and a quarter were brown agouti. So now we're going to have to figure out what was the genotype of the black agouti coat parent. First, let's look at what we know about the offspring's genotypes. What we know is that the albino clearly is homozygous recessive for the C gene. We know the black agouti, it has to have the dominant allele for the A gene, a dominant allele for the B gene, and a dominant allele in the C gene. We also know that it must be heterozygous for the C gene because the albino coat parent could only pass on a recessive allele. And similarly, the brown agouti, we know that it had to have at least a dominant allele for the A, be homozygous recessive for the B, and be heterozygous for the C gene because, again, that's all that the albino coat could pass on. It had to pass on a recessive allele. So what does that tell us about our black agouti-coated parent? Here's what we know. First off, we know that the black agouti coated parent must be heterozygous. And it must be heterozygous because it had to pass on a dominant allele to the black agouti, and it had to pass on a recessive allele to the brown agouti. So it has to be heterozygous because each of our offspring need to be able to get those alleles, and that's where they're from. And next, we know that that means our black agouti-coated offspring has to be heterozygous as well because it had to get the recessive allele from the albino-coated parent. If we look at the C allele, we know that the black agouti coat must be a heterozygote parent as well because it had to pass on a recessive allele to the albino offspring. So 
it has to have the recessive allele. It also has a dominant allele because it had to pass a dominant allele to the black agouti offspring and the brown agouti offspring. So we know that the black agouti coated parent had to be heterozygous for both the B and the C genes. But what about the A gene? Well, one of them had to pass on a dominant allele. And they probably both at minimum have one dominant allele. Otherwise, we would end up with individuals that are going to be just black or brown, but not agouti. So because the offspring that showed color are all agouti, we have a good idea that at least one of these is probably homozygous dominant, but we don't know which one that would be. So we don't know what the albino has as its actual alleles, but we can tell that the black agouti and the brown agouti have to have at least one dominant allele. Next, we're going to just look at some lethal alleles very quickly, and the lethal allele for fur color happens to be yellow. And this time, instead of having a brown allele, we're going to look at the yellow allele on the B gene. So there is a, a, an allele that is for a yellow color, and it works very similarly to brown. So if we were to take two heterozygous for both the B and the C gene, and we were to cross them, what would happen? So we'd end up with 9 16 of our offspring appearing black, zero would appear yellow, and three would appear albino. Or so the question is, why no yellow? How come? Because yellow is lethal when it's homozygous. So if you have an individual that was homozygous for the yellow allele, as it turns out, that organism dies. And it dies very, very young. And so zero of our offspring would appear yellow. And that means that as it turns out, nine twelfths of our offspring would appear black and three twelfths of our offspring would appear albino. That's it for this time. Be awesome, stay awesome.